The Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter number 13, verses number 18 and 19. You pray with us as we proceed in the word. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. We want to talk to you this morning about catching away the word out of one's heart. The wicked one knows the essentiality of the word. He knows where to strike. He knows the area where he's been effective heretofore. And so he's focusing all that he has on catching away the word out of our hearts. The church is built and perpetuated by the word and the spirit without which we have no church. So if the enemy catches away the word, then it leaves us something less than a saint. That's why the Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. When the seeker found the pearl of great price, he sold out everything and hideth it. Why? To make sure it would be uninterrupted. The objective of the enemy is when God speaks to you, makes clear to you this truth. And through whatever means, extricate it from your heart. Then you're where you started from, in a worse condition. If you are anything spiritually at all today, it's because of the word. It's not because of your determination, your ingenuity, your whatever. It's because of the word. We're not using this word word glibly catch away the word now this is the situation it was speaking here about the wayside hearers who just happened to hear the word or somehow inadvertently came in contact with it and they sensed the truth of it but while they're pondering it and don't really lay it away permanently the enemy comes by before it catches root And catch it out of their hearts. That's why we need to place a proper premium on the word of God. Catch it away the word. Now, you've heard me emphasize repeatedly. For you to be actually the word is not just reading a few passages from the Bible. See, everybody's doing that. But it's only the word... When it is as God intended it. Paul said, preach the word, preach the word. He was not talking about reading a verse of scripture and giving a 10 minute essay. Something that you can't copy yourself. But under the inspiration. The inspiration makes it the word. 10 people might preach the same scripture. Maybe only one preaches the word. The scripture itself is the word. But see, the letter kill it, but the spirit makes it alive. So for there be the word, it must be preached under the anointing of the Spirit, and you know the difference. It has a different effect. A person might be ever so doctrinal or exegetical and can go forth, but there's a different effect when the word is preached. It affects you differently. It does something for you. It edifies you. It builds you up. It makes you different. Receive the seed by the wayside, and the enemy catches the word out of your heart. Now listen. Why is the enemy so intent on getting the word out of your heart? Remember this now, and underscore this. If you're standing on truth today, you're standing there because of the word. If you're standing on the word, God will confirm his word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but God's word shall not pass away. Everything is going to perish. Doctors and men will pass away. Men's ideas will pass away, but not the word. So we've got to be, so we can't be wrong about this. We can't be wrong about this. See, everybody's preaching today, all over. I mean, that's 
popular. Preaching is popular today. Religion is popular today. But they're getting something less than the word. Well, how do you know? Because of the effect of it. Now, how do you determine whether or not the word is indeed in you or whether you're hearing or possessing the word? Well, you've got to have a criteria by which to judge yourself. All right? Psalm chapter 119. And I want verse number 10. With my whole heart have I sought thee. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart. That I might not sin against thee. Now you listen. All right. The word of God is a preventive. And our only preventive. Now you follow me closely this morning. I'm teaching, All right. brother. Do you know why the nucleus of the religious world today advocates and preaches that a man must sin? That's a part of that doctrine. That's a part of that teaching. Why? Because they don't have the word in their hearts. The word is a preventive. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's the purpose of the word. That's the purpose of preaching the word that you might not sin. No, we're not talking about our ideas this morning, our doctrine, our dogmas. But if you have sinned, then we all have it one time. We were all born in sin. We understand that. But the word will take it out of us. The word is a preventive, and that's the only preventive. Listen. There's a difference in the word being in you and the word being about you. Everybody's hearing the scriptures read, but they are not imbibing or digesting it. Mm. And therefore, the word does not become a part of you. Mm. Come on, brother. You understand? See, there's some strong scripture on this. Preach, brother. Thy word have I hid in my heart. I hid it. Why? That the wicked one touch it not. You follow me? See, he hid that treasure. Why? Because it's precious. It's valuable. People, places, a small value on the word today. Listen. The enemy might somehow push you around, but he should not push you beyond the word. You get it? You get it? Now listen. How do you know when a person has the word in their heart? Because under pressure, they'll not deviate from it. The enemy might push them, but he cannot push them beyond the word of God by any means or through whatever means. That's what made the difference in the holiness groups in bygone days. What? They went back to the word. All right, come on, bro. They knew and preached that the word affects every phase of our lives. That's right. Help us, Lord. Not this little love believism that they teach us today. But the word, the word. See, none of the word is insignificant. All of it is consequential. That's right. See, you don't select a pet scripture and hold on to that and deny or violate others. For it to be the word, it has to be the entire word. You understand? The entire book. Eat the whole book, the whole word, the entire word. Well, that being the case, why is it that more people don't preach the entire word? Well, because the people won't receive it. People will not receive it. When Jesus began to preach the whole word to those Jews, his disciples, his disciples, they left him. He said, this is a hard thing. It's too much. Listen, the word of God is demanding. It's not some little superficial believism. It's demanding. And Jesus started people off on the right foot. Said, now listen, except, except you are willing to forsake all in thine own life, you can be my disciple. That's the word. Eat my flesh. Come on, brother. He said, now listen. He said, now, I'm not going to start you off on the wrong foot. I'm going to let you know at the very outset, when you receive the word, Persecution is coming along with it. You understand that? Well, that's why the apostles were martyred and lost their lives in that position. What? They accepted the word. And the world is anti the word. The Bible says his name was the word of God. You follow me? His name was the word of God. People are anti-Christ. The anti-Christ is against the word of God. The anti-Christ is not some hilarious, monstrous individual sitting in Europe somewhere. See, that, that's a false idea. Antichrist means those who are against Christ, 
against the word. Amen. Help us, Lord. Help us. Many people preaching about the Antichrist and are a part of the Antichrist. Help us, Lord. The Bible says the spirit of Antichrist is a spirit. It's not an individual. Help us, Lord. Irrespective of how monstrous or ridiculous he might be, is a spirit of the Antichrist against Christ, against the word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Mm. Dwell among us. Christ. Christ is the word. And to be against the word is to be against Christ. And this religious world today is against the word. Oh, they accept a portion of it, that love is the love believe is they accept that, but not the entire word. And we need to go into that. Now, Bless him, Lord. thy word have I hid. You got to hide it away. You got to hide it away. There's no game. See, many people hide away ideas. Now, that's the difference between a dogma and an idea and the word. There's a difference between some dogmatic tradition and the word. The word is much deeper than that. And we need to study this and ponder this this morning. The word. Many people hold on to ideas and deny the word. They hold on to doctrines and deny the word. Because many doctrines are not predicated upon the word. All right, shall we go further? The word have I hid my heart. For what purpose? Now, why is it so essential? What is the essentiality of the word? That I might not sin against you. That's why people preach the sin you must doctrine, but because the word is not in their heart and there's no preventive there. So they have to preach their own experience. All right? What was the word? The seed. The seed. The word that was sown. You understand? That's why you need to eat the word. Help us, Lord. Help and you'll recognize it when you hear it. First John chapter 3. Let's go further. Let's further this idea. Let's further this, if we will. First John chapter number 3. Give me verse number 7. Little children. Little children. Let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. He that doth righteousness. He that doth righteous righteousness. Is righteous. Is righteous. Even as he is Even righteous. as he is righteous. And he that committeth sin. He that committeth sin. Is of the devil. Of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the, the beginning. The devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose. For this the purpose. Son God the son of God was manifested that he might do what? Destroy the works destroy of the devil. Destroy the work of the devil. He doesn't do his job. Whenever a person gets truly saved, the works of the devil is destroyed in their lives. And that's sin. He doesn't do a half job. He does a thorough job. All right, read. Whosoever is born of God does not. Whosoever is born of God. That's the purpose of being born again. We were born in sin, so you have to be born of God to be born out of it. That's why a second birth is necessary. It's not a doctrine. It's a necessity. I'm horrified at some of the teachers. In the last couple of decades, they've been placing special emphasis. I'm a born-again Christian. Don't even know what it's all about. Don't know what it's all about. It's a cliche. It's a spiritual terminology. A born-again Christian. They know that's a necessity. And so the enemy got them on that tangent. But what goes along with it? Help us, Lord. Help us. Now, here are the specifics of a born again life or a born again experience. Now, we want to correlate these scriptures if we will. Read. Whosoever is born of God does, Whosoever not, born of God does, not, commit does sin, not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in oh, him. Here we are. The seed of the word. The sower sowed the seed. The seed of the word. And this is why David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And the Bible says, he that is born of God does not commit sin because his seed is in him. There's a correlation here. All right. The seed is a preventive. There is no preventive otherwise. Church joining is no preventive. Water baptism is no preventive. The seed. The living word. That is the preventive. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. He that, what? Whosoever is born of God. Whosoever is born of God. Does not commit does sin. Does not commit sin. For his seed remains why? in him. Why? What is the preventive? Why doesn't he commit sin? This is the only reason why. Because his seed remaineth in him. What? For he cannot sin because he, he cannot sin. Wait a minute. Don't mean that he doesn't have his will any longer. Right. Don't mean that he cannot deliberately do what he wants to do. But for you to sin, the wicked one has to catch you with a word. 
If you have ever yielded to a temptation and you were genuinely saved, the wicked one caught away the word first. If you get out of the spirit, the word and the spirit agrees, the word will keep you walking in the spirit. You got mad where the seed was caught away first. You lusted where the seed was caught away before you did it. If you ever had a victory. If the seed was ever there to begin with. The seed is a preventive. That's it. There's no need of being theological here and going off on a lot of ramifications. Either the seed is there or it's not there. And if it's there, it does all that the word implies. David says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So that's why the devil won't catch away the word so that then you'll sin because you have no preventive. There's no deterrent against sin. Why? Because the word is not there. Do you know what people are on their knees every night repenting and saying, God forgive me for the same thing over and over again? The word is not there, so there's no preventive. Help, Lord. Help, Lord. And so then what do you do? So they have no other alternative but to try to get out and repent. Well, that's not really repentance anyway. Why? Because first you've got to get the word there to be born again. And if the word is not there, well, you'll just be doing that continuously. You'll be going in a vicious cycle. Read it a little more that, please. Repeat that. Whosoever is born of God does right. not commit sin. Does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. His seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin. He because cannot he sin. is born of God. Because he's born of God. See, listen. David sinned, but he had to dispose of the word of God first. The Bible says David despised the law of God. When the seed was in him, he said, I delight in thy law. I love thy law. But when he lost the seed through lust, then he turned and despised the law of God. Mm. Don't you know when you sin, your whole spirit changes? The love and the delight you had for God will turn to hatred for God, despite your testimony. We've got to be lined up with the word of God here. We've got to face God. And we can't be wrong about this. We can't be wrong about this. That's why when you get up in the morning before God and get your Bible before you begin your day's activity and read, you're not just trying to increase your scriptural repertoire here. You are bearing the word down in your heart. You don't know what you're going to face today. And if somehow the devil has caught the word out of you, you might do anything. I don't care how mild-mannered you are. How reserved uh, and quiet and, and sober you are. If the word is caught away, you have no preventive. Against anything. The word of faith, which we preach. You can't trust God without the word in your heart. But if the devil catches away the word, you'll flunk. The word from the beginning to the end. The word, the word, the word. We're not just talking about the cold dead letter here. For God so loved the world. That's the cold dead letter. But that killeth, and it has killed many. But the word is alive because the word and the spirit agrees, and the spirit give life to the word, give essence to the word, give substance to the word. The seed remaineth in him, and he cannot. That's how, listen, I said the word is prevented. When Jesus was led to be tempted of the devil, and the devil came from every direction, everything imaginable. And the Bible says Jesus was tempted in every point as we are. Let's study the word this morning. In every point as we are, yet without sin. And the Bible says he was an example who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Jesus went through those things not as a God, but as a man. Right. Jesus faced the devil and everything he could throw at him. As a man, as you are, right. with lack passion that you have, Jesus could have enjoyed anything that the people on Francis Street or wherever you enjoy. Jesus could have enjoyed, I guess, if there's any delight in getting high, maybe a, a lot of strange flesh. He could have enjoyed that much than anybody else. Yeah. Why? Because he was all God and was all man. He could have been out of example as a God, because we're not gods. <laughs> so he had to go through as a man. 
He felt the pressure of temptation. He was sad when people came against him. Because when Judas betrayed, he said, I can understand it with my enemy, but then my bosom friend did it to me. And they grieved him. When they forsook him and fled, they grieved him. They tore him asunder. Why? He was affected by it. But he went through it right. Why? Because he's going to judge you in the last day. And when you say, I couldn't help but do it, he said, oh, yes, you can because I helped it. You're going to say, I just couldn't hold out. He said, yes, you could have because I held out. I went through an entire lifetime. An entire lifetime. How did you do it? Well, let's check the instance. When the enemy came against him, he said, the word. Come on. The devil tried to use the word too. The devil knows the word too. And if you aren't careful, he'll take the word and outdo you. You get the truth in your heart and he'll take the word and try to subdue you with the word. He tried that with Jesus. What did he do? He took the same word and perverted it. If you aren't careful, you get the word in your heart and somebody will take that same Bible and subdue you. I just opened one of my packages this morning and a little fat package. I said, I wonder what this is. A book of Mormons and a letter trying to evangelize me. And proclaimed came that that's the word. Well, it's working with many. I mean, they'll withstand you, whatever. And this is the situation. The devil knows the word too. He knows the letter. But Christ says, it is also written. And that's how the Bible says he left in the spirit. After all of the temptation were ended, he left in the spirit. Why? By standing on the word. Let me show you something, children. You're going to have to get deep in your experiences. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. We want to make a reference here. Now, in God's true church, it's available to you an experience that can take you clean through. Now, you listen to me. If you have a genuine, enlightened experience with God, the enemy should not be able to push you beyond the word. Nobody, under no circumstance. No group or individual. The government, the law, nobody should be able to push you beyond the word. You follow me? Why? Now, I'm going to show you the essentiality of it. The angel of the church of Philadelphia, right? These things says he that is holy. These things says who? He that is holy. He that is holy. He that is true. He that is true. He that hath the key of David. He that hath the key of David. He that openeth. Openeth. And no man shutteth. No man shutteth. And shutteth. Shut it. And no man openeth. No man openeth. I know thy works. I know your works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it. And no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength. You have a little strength. And he has kept my word. Kept my word. And has not denied my name. And not denied my name. Behold, I And the Bible says, he exalted word above his name, all of his name. The name, he has seven, Jehovah, Jehovah, Jireh, but the word is above that. Come on. We often quote the scripture, oh, he's Jehovah, Jireh, he provided for me, but the word is above that. You can have all those provisions, but if you don't have the word, it's a no avail. Yeah. Listen to this, if you will, read. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Which say they are Jews and are not. Which have said they are Jews and are not. But do lie. But do lie. Behold. Behold. I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. I'll make them to come and worship before your feet. And to know that I have loved thee. And know that I've loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Kept what? The here, word. We, here we are. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee. Jesus said in your patience possess you your soul. Come on. What do you have reference to? Mean that adverse situation, persecutions, coming from every imaginable source. And it, it shouldn't be able to push you any further than the word. Your conviction. If the word of God is down in your heart, I don't care what you undergo, it should not be able to push you beyond the word. Help. Don't tell me about an unusual circumstance. Help. Oh, this was a unique case regardless of that. If you got the word in you, 
nothing or no circumstance or nobody should be able to push you beyond the word. Help us all, Lord. Now, I, you, you find that backs up often. I backs up, yeah. I get the word, I'm stopping. I'm not going in further than that. I don't care who's involved or who I have to sacrifice, who I got to cut off, or what I got to do. I'm not going beyond the word. When God enlightens my heart with the word, when he plants the word down in my heart and makes it clear to me, and you, and to whomever, nothing should be able to back you beyond the word. See, Do you know why all of these religious groups that were once on fire for God are now dead and cold and dry? What? The devil caught the word out of their heart. They started off with everything the word said. Modest apparel, the word. Divine healing, the word. Proper spirits and attitude, the word. But the enemy backed them off of it. And now they're dead and cold and formal and lifeless. Help us, Lord. That's what he's endeavoring and destined to do. To get the word out of your heart. Yeah. Even after you receive it, to get the word out of your heart. Through whatever means. Catch up the word out of your heart. Because he you knows you're not effective. See, I don't care what you do and how well you do it. If the word's not down there, it's See, totally bro. ineffective. That's it, bro. I can preach all I want to. I can preach clear doctrine. But if the word's not in my heart, if I've lost the word, the effect of the word, I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. That's what you should be doing before God. In your fasting and in your praying, what, hiding the word down in your heart, cramming the word in your heart, what, that you might keep the word of his patience. He said, because you've kept the word of my patience, you wouldn't back up, you wouldn't nestle under, you wouldn't bow, and you wouldn't bend, and now you certainly won't burn. That's what it's all about, children. All these other things. It's the word. It's the word. Many times people are going overboard out in left field here on a tangent here. But it's the word. It's the word. Help us, Lord. And we've got to know what is the word and what is not the word. Yeah. And we've got to be willing to seal it with our blood. Help, Lord. Because you've kept the word of my patience. Now listen. The benefits here. Come on. You listen to it. See, God governs everything that comes your way. Do you understand that? Everything that happened to you has to come by God first. That come should on. console you. Come on, bro. Nothing can come before you unless it come by God first. That's why you should be able to take it. Amen. Amen. I remember when my baby was young, one time uh, my wife would warm up a little bottle in the middle of the night. And before she would give it to the baby, she would put the a drop of the milk on the tender spot of an arm to determine whether or not the baby could take it without any harm done or any pain invoked. And sometimes it would be a little too warm and she would run a little cold water over it. Before the baby tasted, it had to come by mama. Before the devil can pile too much on you, it had to come by God. What's happened to you is not an accident, it's not an incident. Do you understand that? No your plight today, whatever your predicament might be, whatever your plight might be, it came by God first. He is not oblivious to it. Yeah. He's fully aware of it. You, do you understand that? Sometimes you think you've forgotten, you peck back in the corner and God's passing you by. He's nonchalant about your predicament. But that's not the case. That's encouraging, brother. That is not the case. And I will assure you, I will assure you this morning, I certify you. It's got to come by God first. That's why I can wait on God because it's got to come by him first. He knows about it. He tested it before it came my way. And you get before him, he says, Lord, I just couldn't take it anymore. He says, oh, yes, you could because I, I tried it before you take, got it. I know just how much pressure was involved. I knew the pain involved. I knew everything that was involved. I knew the pressure of the temptation. I knew all about it. I knew every detail. Before I allowed it to come your way, I tested it first. Many people are afraid to get saved. Well, I'm afraid I couldn't hold out. Well, you can rest assured of this, that God will not allow you to be tempted above that you're able. Come on, brother. And he knows your capability. That's he knows word. your ability. That's the word. And you can rest assured, if it was allowed to come your way, you could have stood. That's encouraging. But now it's going to be trying, yes. You could try too, all night long, tempted in the garden, be almost beyond measure. Prayed all night long to submit to the will of God. But God knew that. God was aware of it. He knew the extent of it. We better get the word in us and get, get clear on the word of God. Yeah. If God allows it, then you ought to be able to take it. It's to his glory. If God allows it and you go through it, it will glorify God. Amen. Amen. But, it but it takes patience. 
because you've kept the word of my patience. You listen to me. Listen good to me this morning. Because you've kept the word of my patience, I'll do what? I'll Verse number 10. Verse I will keep you from. Because you've kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from I the hour also of, will keep you what? From the hour of temptation. From the hour of temptation. Will you pray with me? Or the tip, this hour of temptation is more than a fast woman passing by. It's something deeper than that. I don't have time to go into that today. Hour of temptation, when they said they were tempted and saw on the thunder, that means something beyond the little ordinary temptation which you all labor. Because you have kept the word of my patience. Because you stood when it seemed impossible to stand. You stood when it would seem uh, ridiculous to try to go any further. You stood when it seemed that your situation would be endless. When it seemed there was no end to it. That you, I don't deserve this, but you stood anyway. Now, I'm going to keep you from. Listen, you better get this one. I'm, I'm going to keep you from. Not in. Read it. I also will keep thee from. From. The hour of temptation. Now, since you have stood and you made 100% on all your tests, you're going to be exempted from the rest of them. Mm. When I was in school, if we maintained a B average, we didn't have to take the final. Where well, I went to school. And God says, because you stood, you didn't back up. You prayed all night rather than submit it or yield. You put your life on the line. Now, you won't have to go through these things that others are going through. Why? Because now you maintain an average. So we have determined that if you maintain that average, then you do that in the final. So you won't have to go through. God said, you won't have to go through another one. See, when you go through tests, they're for a purpose. Do you understand? See, God's trying to make you, trying to get something out of you, or make you aware of yourself. He's trying to prove something. But if you've already proven it, he needs to prove it no further. Oh, Lord. Some people are tested all their lives over what they, sh they should be far beyond that. What? Because God still got to prove you. Got to go through again. Got to go through again. I work at the courthouse many times, and, uh, and then maybe call a mistrial. And uh, just, all right, you'll have to go start all over again. You're doing yourself a favor when you go through with God, regardless of what you're facing, regardless of the pain, regardless of the agony, to stand for God four square. Then God will determine, like Abraham, I don't know if I'm where Abraham had to offer Isaac again anymore. Why? Because he has proven. See, now I know. Now you're going to be exempted from any other situation like that. But you didn't stand. Now you got to go through it again. It's going to be more difficult next time. I am telling you, you sh I preached down in Birmingham some time ago. You didn't stand when you should have. And now, later on, when they saw what they had lost, now they were, I'm ready to stand. He said, oh, no, you won't do any good now. You didn't stand when you should have stood. I gave you every opportunity to stand. I was there to support you. I was there to encourage you. And you didn't stand. Now to try to stand won't even avail anything. You didn't stand when you should have stood. I encouraged your heart. I inspired you to take your stand. And you let the devil talk you out of it because all the big giants, oh, it's too much for me. It's too big a decision to make. It's too big a step to make. And you didn't do it. And the devil will keep magnifying those things. And you decide, oh, I just can't go through that. This is too much. I just can't make that kind of decision. I can't make that kind of consecration. I cannot make that kind of sacrifice. Well, then, he'll have to send something else. A bigger giant next time. Because you didn't stand where you should have stood. Now, he said, because you have, you, have, uh, you have kept the word of my patience, I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation. You won't have to go through that. Laid by, you can lay your crop by. You won't have to go through that anymore. Don't you realize it's a blessing to stand when you should stand? Then God won't have to take you through that anymore because you've already proven yourself. He won't take you through that anymore. You understand? He said, I saw that you were willing to stand until you die. If you had to go on celibate all your life, you would, have, you would have done it. If you had to live without a husband, live without a wife, you would have done it for the word's sake. That's good, brother. You would have done it. Now... I know. Now I can go and bless you because I know you're going to stand. You better pray. I won't go into this service. <laughs> because you're just waiting for it. 
can I maybe read another verse of scripture here before we close to perhaps? All right. Now, Very good, brother. the word going to try us in the last day. This is encouraging, brother. The word going to try us in the last day. Revelation 2012, quickly. Revelation 2012. All right. And I saw the, I dead, saw the dead, small and great, small and great stand, before, stand God, before God, and the books, and the books were, were opened, and another book, and another book was which opened, is book of life, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged, the dead were judged out of those things which, which were, written were written in the, the books, books according, according to their works. Wait a moment. The word. When we get before God in the judgment, this word. Now, there were two books. One word contains our deeds, our works our conduct, our deportment, and it will be stacked beside the word of God. God. Yeah, all arguments will be settled here now. Yeah. Now if I say this is the word, you can say it's not. You, you can contest me, but you won't be able to contest this in the judgment. You can counteract what I say, but not this. Because this is the work of God. You can say, I don't believe that. Well, you don't have to. But God will make a determination in the end. He can, when, you, when you open the book, when you open the book, that's, that's final. That scripture has always troubled me because it's so final. Amen. If somehow I've gotten off the word, or for whatever reason they live up to the word, well, I'm going to be reckoned with. See? And it won't be your interpretation against mine. It's going to be what you think against what God said. You understand? So now, you might think you're ever so clear, but... When they say cash in, they say, as I would, I will. I'll, if you, if you would, I'll do it. If you're going to step out somewhere, then you better be sure you're on the word. I declare. You can't jump out there and decide that you weren't on the word. The word. St. John chapter 12, verse 48, quickly. 12, 48. We'll try to conclude with this. We'll try to conclude right here. If you'll pray, be patient just a moment. 12, 48, St. John 12, 48. All right. He that rejecteth me. He that rejecteth me. And receiveth not my receive words. Receiveth not my words. Have one that judgeth him. Have one that judgeth him. The word that I have. The spoken, word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the And last listen, day. when the word is preached under the anointing, that's Christ speaking. Yeah. When the Bible said Christ uh, preached to those spirits in prison during the time, the antediluvian period, that wasn't Christ himself. Come on, brother. That wasn't giving them a second chance. Come on. Those people which were in prison, but that was the spirit of Christ preaching through Noah. Yeah. And when the spirit of God is preaching through one, it's just the same as Christ himself preaching. So the Bible says, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, for whatever reason, the same word that you rejected, that you finagled, that you distorted, that you rested, going to judge you in the last day. And then all argument will be settled for eternity. The word. The Bible says heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word. That's why I'm going to stand on the word. I love this congregation, but you're not going to pull me off the word. Well, we won't feed you anyway. You don't have to feed me. I'm not going to need the word. If I leave the word, I don't need anything needed anyway. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. My family might say, well, I'll, I'll desert you. Or I'll reject Well, you may do what you will, but now I'm not going to move off the word. The Lord said, I'll put you in jail. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm going to take the word with me. Can I take my new little testament with me? No, well, I'll take it in my heart. You can't, you can't snatch it out of my heart. The word. Now, this morning, dear one, this morning, that's what it's all about. We don't have some organization here with a lot of set do's and don'ts, but the word. This is our only doctrine, our only guide, our only dogma, our only... The word, the word, the word. That's it. This is final. Come on, you know, a lot of, a lot of men devised ideas and doctrine and standards. It's the word. Everything we advocate is backed by the word. That's what makes it the church of God. The word. That's what we derive our name from. The word. Now, there's no hope of survival, spiritually or otherwise, aside from the word. And this morning... If we're not standing on the word, when Jesus bids the cloud, you'll have nowhere to stand because heaven and earth going to pass away. Well, what about the millennium? Well, there won't be nowhere to have a millennium because heaven and earth going to pass away. Why are you going to have a millennium? 
There'll be no plane for the millennium because there won't be no heaven, there won't be no earth down in the atmosphere and there'll be no earth to stand on. So why are you going to have them? Oh, the new heaven, new earth. That's not talking about that. I wish I had time to go into that. Now, if you want help this morning, if you want help this morning, will you stand? Will you stand? If you want help, shall we all stand? And you come forth. We have a prayer room. We have an altar. And get the word down in you. You're going to need it. You're going to need it. You're going to need it. Get the word down in you, down inside you, that you might not sin against him. You might not back up. You might have a deterrence against temptation and trials and tests of every sort. The word, the word, the word. That's what makes the difference. That infuriates the devil. The word. You can preach all you want or quote all the scriptures you want to, but the word, the word, the real word backed up by the spirit, it horrifies the devil. And that's what he wants to get the word out of you. Get the word out of you. Then he'll let you go. There's no issue. Just get the word out of you. Just catch away that what God has planted in your heart. That's what the devil is destined to do. Catch away the word out of your heart. Do whatever means. If we succumb to it, we'll be the eventual and eternal losers in the end. What do we sing? Back to the blessed old Bible. The Bible, the Bible, the word of God. In the right fashion. With the right interpretation. With the right anointing. With the right inspiration. The word of God. The word of God. The blessed old Bible. That's all we have to offer. The Bible, the word of God. Nothing more. Not my ideas, not my thoughts, but the word of God. If it's not securely in your heart... Maybe we need to come pray about it this morning. And let's solidify it. And pack it away down in our souls for these evil times in which we're living. You know why the church has imbibed and taken in so many things today? What? The washing of water by the word. They're not preaching the word and everything creeps in. Everything creeps in. What? Because the word is absent. They're bereft of the word of God. There was a time that all holiness churches had a real Bible standard. But the devil caught the word out of their heart. Now they have nothing to hold that standard with. We have holiness, Nazarene, holiness schools all over the country. Church of God schools, Nazarene schools, and Free Methodist schools, and Pilgrim Holiness schools, all of them, who held Bible standards. But the devil caught the word out of their heart. Now they're just like anybody else. How did it happen? How did the transformation come to pass? The word was taken out of their hearts. And now they have no deterrent. The world will run roughshod over them. Let me say this to you. When the enemy comes in whatever fashion, his primary objective is to catch the word of God out of your heart. Then he knows you're unprotected. You're insecure. There's no deterrent against sin. So God help us to be certain about this. We can't be wrong about this. Unless the word is down in our heart, whatever else we do in the name of religion doesn't even matter. Our position in church, our contribution financially, nothing matters unless the word of God is down in our heart. And there is no way to prevent sinning but have the word down in your heart, whoever you are.